Hello. So I am Pierre Deling, emeritus in the School of Math, and my task is to introduce Vladimir Voevodsky. So as a relative large number of mathematicians in this country, he was educated in the former Soviet Union. He was student of Moscow State University from 83 to 89, then came to this country, got his PhD at Harvard in uh, 92, was at Northwestern University from 96 to 99, and then he had some nice collaboration with Suslin. And then he came to the Institute first as a member in 98 and became professor here in 2002. So he has been able to successfully introduce methods of homotopy theory in algebraic geometry. And for me, this is somewhat like mixing water and fire. Objects of algebraic geometry are very rigid, with very few maps from one to another, where objects of homotopy theory are very flexible and it looks hopelessly naive to try to mix the two together. But that's what he has been able to do. Uh, for me, a, a first example was this extraordinary paper with uh, Suslin, where it's clear that you cannot imitate the definition of homology using simplices in algebraic geometry, just by using algebraic map from simplices to algebraic varieties. But what this paper saw is that if you allow finitely many valued map instead of plain maps, then you can perfectly imitate the definition of simplicial homology using this kind of algebraic simplices, at least for Torfen coefficients. And integral coefficient, it's hopeless anyway. Uh, then, you yes, also be you able to use the idea of homotopy theory to obtain a good triangulated category of motif, uh, hopefully good, and has been able to use such tool to prove extraordinary results about Galois cohomology, so cohomology for Galois group of field. Uh, first, he proved this is related to mod 2 cohomology, the Milner convector about its structure relation with Milner K groups. And for this, he got the Fields Medal in 2002. And then more recently, with some geometric input from Rost, he obtained similar results for all primes, so about Galois cohomology of field. And now his interests are in another direction, another improbable mixture, here homotopy theory, formal language, automatic verification of proofs, things which seems to have not much in common. He started today is what if current foundation of mathematics are inconsistent, and I am very curious to hear what he has to say. Um, hello, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, coming to my talk. I'm quite nervous because of the, uh, because the subject is such a um, controversial thing, so I'll, um, I'll try to do my best. And I'll try to explain what I mean by current foundations and what I mean by their possible inconsistency. So, but I'll start with, with a few um, historical, uh, actually, comments. So we are celebrating uh, these days the 80th anniversary of the um, Institute for Advanced Studies, but we could actually be also celebrating uh, the 80th anniversary of something else, which is probably even more momentous uh, than the foundation of the Institute for Advanced Studies. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, as it happens, it's uh, almost exactly 80 years ago that Gödel um, understood, uh, Gödel came up with the proof of his second incompleteness theory. Um, what we know, uh, we don't know, of course, the exact date when it 
sort of uh, crystallized in his mind. But what we do know is that when he was uh, presenting his, uh, the proof of his first incompleteness theorem uh, on September 6, 1930, he didn't know about the second incompleteness theorem. And when he uh, submitted an abstract of his final paper in October 23, 1930, he already knew about the second incompleteness theorem. So it happened somewhere between September 6 and October 23. So it's like we're almost right in the middle of that uh, period 80 years ago. So um, let me formulate the, uh, his second incompleteness theorem in the following form, which might be my look a little bit uh, uh, too strong for some who, uh, who know the, uh, the original formulation, but um, I'm going to argue that uh, that's uh, how it really should be uh, understood. So the theorem uh, says, in my understanding, is that uh, it can be proved that it's impossible to prove uh, consistency of uh, the first order arithmetics, uh, elementary number theory, or of any other theory which is uh, at least as strong. Now, um, uh, von Neumann uh, commented on, uh, von Neumann somehow understood that Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, which spoke about uh, just unprovable statements in, in um, arithmetic, uh, implied the second, and uh, he wrote to, to Gödel the following uh, interesting words, that uh, thus I think that your result has solved negatively the foundational question. There is no rigorous justification for classical mathematics. And that's von Neumann to Gödel on November 29, 1930. Again, 80 years ago, pretty much. So, um, so let's see how things kind of developed after that. Um, and I'm, uh, so Gödel himself, I'll, I'll, I'll come to it in, in, uh, in the next slide, but okay, l l let me first say that, so we have like something which I'm, I'm choosing to call Gödel's paradox. Uh, so the, on the one hand, we know, and I probably should have put quotes around this no, that the first order arithmetic is consistent. That's, that's the common, commonly accepted fact among mathematicians and um, as a consequence among everybody else. On the other hand, it can be proved that it's impossible to prove that it is consistent. So we have this two statements, and uh, I should tell you, if one really thinks deeply about it, it this is extremely unsettling for any rational mind. It's, <laughs> um, and what one comes to is that, so what are the choices in, in resolving this paradox? And there are three choices. Um, well, aside from well, since there are three choices. So the, the first choice is that if we know that it's consistent, then somehow we should be able to come up with a proof. And then the Gödel theorem, the second incompleteness theorem, as it been stated uh, before, is incorrect. Uh, that is uh, the... That is a choice which was essentially made by 90% of uh, people who were seriously uh, working on the subject. So it was a choice, I think, made by Gödel himself, and it was a choice made by many others. So there was many, many attempts uh, to, to still kind of prove that the first order arithmetic is consistent despite the Gödel theorem, and somehow circumvent this theorem in one way or another. And I will speak about um, such attempts in a few minutes. So there is a second possibility, which is uh, which we can admit that there is some kind of transcendental knowledge uh, which humans can obtain uh, 
which is correct, but not, not just, which not just cannot be rationally kind of supported, but can be, it can be proved that it cannot be rationally supported. And uh, that uh, choice has been also made by many and been a source of, of a really large body of dubious philosophical uh, texts, I would say. And, <laughs> Uh, uh, well, dubious is, of course, my own personal opinion. Uh, and so um, the third possibility, which is the least, uh, least considered one, so to speak, is, is that uh, we can admit the fact that our convention that we know that it is consistent is actually an illusion in this case, and that the actual formal system of the first order arithmetic is inconsistent, and that's what the proof means. And um, I want to um, discuss this third possibility today, because I think that uh, it is time to consider this third possibility very, very seriously, and to, um, <clears throat> and that's basically the only, the only choice which is left, because the, um, so many efforts were made to uh, try to uh, justify the first choice, and they were all unsuccessful. Uh, the second choice seems to be like, I personally don't want to talk about it much. And uh, <laughs> so we are only left with the third. And so, so let's, let's consider it as a serious possibility and see what consequences it might have. So first, let's, uh, let's see what kind of arguments uh, do we have in the support of, of this knowing uh, of the consistency. And in the process, I'll uh, outline what consistency actually means. And it, it, inconsistency of, of first order arithmetic doesn't mean that two plus two doesn't equal four. Please don't worry. It, it's something much, much more uh, kind of, it really has nothing to do with, with the uh, validity of uh, the usual computational uh, mathematics which is being used all around us. And, and if arithmetics is this first order arithmetic is inconsistent, it doesn't mean that planes still start falling uh, from, from, the, from the air or bridges still falling down. No, it's uh, mathematics, constructive, well, the actual computational mathematics uh, is supported by much more than our belief in consistency of a formal theory. So, um, so anyway, so the, the two uh, mathematical arguments are uh, in the support of the consistency of the first order arithmetic as a formal theory. Standard two um, are as follows. So the first one, I, I'm calling it formulas as subset interpretation of uh, first order arithmetic, and I'll explain what it is. And the second one is a proof given by um, German logistician Gensen at the end of uh, 1930s. Uh, and this argument uh, uses induction on the lens, on, on the structure of the proofs in arithmetic to show that one cannot uh, obtain a proof of uh, absurdity. And I will. Um, show what, what both of those mean. So first of all, what is the first order arithmetic? And what does it mean by its in or consistency? So the first order arithmetic is, is it's not a collection of rules for operating with, uh, with numbers. No, it, it's something entirely different. It's, uh, uh, it's a mathematical object. Uh, which belongs to the class of mathematical objects which are called formal theories in first order logic. And uh, a formal theory uh, is specified by a collection of data of the following form. So it's uh, specified by uh, two alphabets, one for special symbols and one for names of variables. Um, it's specified, there are certain rules which one probably, which, I, which I'm calling syntactic rules, which determine what sequence of, uh, of letters from, from both alphabets uh, 
which, uh, which actually specify for, for, for a given collection of names of uh, variables, it specifies which sequences of letters from uh, both alphabets are grammatically correct formulas in these variables. And these syntactic rules are such that it's easy to verify. So if one given a sequence of uh, symbols from both alphabets, then doing some simple al verification algorithm, one can uh, determine whether it's a, a grammatically correct formula or not. Then there are deduction rules. So there is a notion of a closed formula. A closed formula is a formula with no free variables. So the number of free variables is zero. So there are deduction rules which are certain operations on closed formulas. So it's, it's a certain ways to, to combine some closed formulas to obtain a new closed formula. Um, they're kind of combinatorial rules. Um, and um, I'll come to it in a moment again. So the first component of a, of a formal theory is a collection of kind of initial closed formulas, which are called axioms. So we have this kind of a um, combinatorial game, a Lego, I don't know, uh, where we have some initial pieces and we have rules by means of which we can form new pieces out of these initial ones. And um, anything which can be formed from these initial axioms by, by means of these uh, deduction rules is called a theorem. Uh, in principle, this is an extremely general uh, definition and one can have formal, in this, in, in formal theories in that sense which have no meaning other than just some combinatorial uh, rearrangement of symbols. But uh, typically, they're being um, used to, uh, to formalize some, some uh, fragments of, of natural reasoning, and it's done uh, as follows. Um, so, a series of first-order logic a form a subclass of among all formal series, and uh, <coughs> among their special symbols, there are these six uh, standard symbols of first order logic, which uh, um, every mathematician, I don't know if, if they're learned at school in any, uh, in any way, but definitely learned by any mathematician. So there are, the first few are called quantifiers. It's for all and exist. Uh, yeah, so excuse me, for all and exist, uh, and I should say something about it. So, so this, these are symbols, this inverted A, inverted E, and this uh, little V, and this uh, little inverted V, and this, this, this six, six, six things are symbols of, um, of the special symbol alphabet. Now what's written on the right from them in, in quotes, these are translations of these symbols into natural language. So this is not a part of formal theory at all. It's, uh, it's, it's something, uh, external to the formal theory. It's some rules which allow one to translate formulas of the formal theory into sentences of natural language. Um, and uh, so, so here the, um, the rules are such that this uh, inverted A is translated as for all, inverted E is translated as there exist, and then there is or, and, implies, and not. There are also uh, parentheses and um, and I think usually a uh, period which I used as punctuation marks in, in the formulas. Um, so a first order theory is called inconsistent. Um, if, uh, if there is a closed formula such that, closed formula A such that A is a theorem and also not A is a theorem. So, um, the formal system of arithmetic contains among its special symbols also symbols for 0, 1. Well, there are actually several different versions, but like one of the standard ones, it would contain additional symbols for 0, 1, uh, addition, multiplication, equality, and let's say the, uh, the greater um, sign. 
Um, so again, these are special symbols, and when I'm saying that it's equality, it means that that's how I translate it, the appearance of this special symbol in the formula into a natural language. So that's an example of a closed formula, and uh, that's its uh, actual form. It's just a sequence of symbols from this alphabet. Um, and what is below is its translation into natural language, which translates into for all n there exists m such that, and then there is some uh, arithmetical expression. Hmm? Oh, uh, ah, interesting, actually. So that I've corrected it. Yeah, thank you. There should be, a, yeah, as, as stated here, this, uh, this sequence of symbols represents a syntactically incorrect expression. <laughs> so for it to be a syntactically a correct closed formula, one has to put an N between the star and the plus, and that's my um, typo. Um, so, so closed formulas can be translated into English as statements about natural numbers. Uh, formulas which are not closed, so which contain free variables, as, as it's called, can be translated in, into English as descriptions of subsets uh, in the set of natural numbers or more generally in the set of uh, sequences of natural numbers. So for example, if I re remove the very uh, beginning of the of the uh, first formula, so instead of writing for all n, I'll just remove this for all n, just consider this. So this says there exists m 3n squared plus 5m squared plus 7 equals 17mn. So one, translate, one interprets it as a description of the subset of natural numbers, which consist of natural numbers n, such that there exists m, such that this equation is satisfied. If I had more than one free variable, I would have a description of a subset in uh, the set of pairs of natural numbers. Now, the deduction rules, as, as I said, are just formal uh, combinatorial rules to operate with these sequences of symbols. They're kind of, you have one sequence of symbols which satisfies some condition, you have another sequence of symbols which satisfies some condition. Then you can kind of permute them in a certain way and do certain things with them, and you get another sequence of symbols, which is said to be uh, deduced from the two previous ones. And uh, those combinatorial rules are, uh, are chosen in such a way as to reflect the usual natural deduction rules for, uh, for statements, in this case, about subsets um, of sequences of natural numbers. So, for example, if there is a statement that uh, for all n uh, something holds, uh, and then there is um, uh, and then there is a statement that there exists n that something else holds, then from this I can deduce that there exists n such that both the first something and the second something holds. And I can do it using one of the uh, formal deduction rules. So now what, uh, so going back to the definition of a formal system, one, one starts with the axioms, which is a collection of statements which are kind of verifiably correct, so which, when you translate them into English, they, uh, they map into, into something which, which, uh, which is true about natural numbers. Uh, and then there are deduction rules, and using these deduction rules you get many, many more statements which are also supposed to be true because on each step you use the logical uh, operation which should make a true statement out of other true statements. Now that would make perfect sense if, if each uh, um, formula actually had kind of um, material meaning in a sense. What happens in arithmetic is, is not that. Um, there is a serious problem with, the, uh, with this interpretation. Uh, so this interpretation of, uh, of formulas as subsets was, of course, the original uh, source for the certainty that arithmetic is consistent. 
And in fact, it was, I, I suspect, the source of the original formulation of, of formal arithmetic as it was. So um, the problem here is that the subsets which correspond to general formulas are really not, um, are really totally surreal. They are, it can be proved uh, that, that there are formulas like, let's say, with one free variable. So a formula with one free variable will describe a subset of natural numbers. But one can prove that there are formulas with one free variable which describe a subset for which it's algorithmically impossible to show for, not for a single number, whether it belongs to this subset or not, or doesn't belong to this subset. So it's, it's a subset about which you can prove that it's impossible to say anything about this subset whatsoever. Uh, so using this, this kind of objects as intermediate steps in, in, logical, um, in chains of logical conclusions, uh, I find it inconvincing as, as an argument for consistency. So that's, that's my critique for the first um, for the first argument in the support of this no. Um, now, uh, speaking of the second argument in the support of the no, it's the Gensen's proof. I, unfortunately, I cannot uh, explain it in, in much detail here. Um, what he does is he considers this as a formal system. No interpretations are assumed. Uh, and uh, he considers the structure of the deduction sequences, so to speak. And uh, each deduction sequence can be uh, assigned kind of a, something like, like a collection of trees, a finite trees, trees I mean in mathematical sense, so kind of combinatorial objects. So one can assign a combinatorial object which measures the complexity of the deduction process. And then one can, uh, <coughs> Then one can present an argument which uses induction on this. Uh, so, so these this combinatorial objects are called, are called ordinals less than epsilon zero. And one can uh, give a definition what, is, what does it mean for two ordinals to be less, one less than another. And that's all quite, uh, quite constructive. And, um, and then he shows, uh, Gensner's proof is that uh, if there is a proof of contradiction, if there is an inconsistency in uh, formal arithmetic, then there would exist a sequence of these um, ordinals which is decreasing at each step but never terminates. So an infinite decreasing sequence of these ordinals. And then he... Uh, and then there is a certain... Uh, argument, I would put it quote unquote, which uh, then he says that that's unlikely. I mean, rather it's something like he says that it's self-evident that that cannot happen. Um, so this self-evidence is extremely uh, suspicious because uh, in a complete uh, agreement with Gödel's theorem, one can show that it's impossible to prove using the usual induction and usual enumeration techniques that any such decreasing sequence uh, terminates. So it's impossible to prove using the usual uh, reasoning means that it terminates. Uh, the only reason to, uh, to say that it terminates is to declare that it's self-evident. So that, again, is not uh, very convincing. So. Uh, so basically what it means is that if we find inconsistency in, uh, in the first order arithmetic, it will mean that there will be this non-terminating sequence of, of uh, ordinals less than epsilon zero. So what? That, that's, that's an interesting conclusion, but it's, uh, it's not uh, earth shattering in any way. Um. <coughs> so, um, so here we come to the uh, second part of, um, of our investigation in terms of what, uh, what such an inconsistency would imply. So, so the first part was kind of 
so there are these arguments in support of consistency. Let's consider, let's look at them carefully and see. So assuming consistency, let's look at this argument and don't we get some sort of a really uh, obvious contradiction? And I'm, I'm arguing that no, we don't get any obvious contradiction. We, we get that certain things which look self-evident to which looked self-evident to some people will turn out to be false, but these things have absolutely no uh, material meaning. I mean, this, this, these are things which can be neither uh, verified nor falsified by any sort of an experiment. So, so these things are purely surrealistic and so can be either false or true with, with no problem. Um, but let's see what it will mean for mathematics because that's... Um, that's, of course, something which on the mind of anyone, any mathematician who starts to consider such a possibility. <coughs> so first of all, inconsistency in the first order arithmetic will mean uh, inconsistency of almost every other foundational theory in mathematics, standard foundational theory in mathematics. So it would mean inconsistency of set theory in particular or of all, all kinds of flavors of set theory. Uh, what is a little less known but uh, also true is that inconsistency of classical first order arithmetic implies inconsistency of so called constructive or intuitionistic uh, arithmetic, and that has been shown by, by Gödel himself in 1933. And that's a purely formal uh, proof which takes a proof of contradiction in, in classical. Theory. So, so the difference for, for non for non mathematician non logician, the difference here between classical and and intuitionistic, is that intuitionistic doesn't allow for um, it, it doesn't include the rule that uh, double negation of a proposition equals the proposition. So, class, in, in classical case, one one has the rule that the double negation of a statement is equivalent to the statement itself. In intuitionistic, uh, this rule is uh, excluded. Um, however, one can show that uh, as far as the issue of consistency is concerned, it, it doesn't change a thing. So if, if, the first, if we find inconsistency in the first order arithmetic, then, then all of those theories are, uh, then we'll be able to construct inconsistencies in all of these theories as well. So, um, so, so what, what, what should we do about it? Because I'm, I'm quite seriously uh, suspecting that such an inconsistency can uh, at some point be found. As, as I said, because of the three, uh, only three choices there, and um, one of them must be true, and the first two are unlikely to be true. So, um, <coughs> well, actually, as far as... Uh, as far as the transcendental knowledge is concerned, I, I want to, uh, to point out that uh, while I may uh, admit a possibility of such knowledge concerning things natural in a sense, uh, the, such a thing as the first or formal first order arithmetic is totally a creation of, of human minds. And there is absolutely no reason for transcendental forces to kind of ensure its, its consistency by transcendental means. And, <laughs> Um, so the Gödel argument, uh, in fact, is general enough to basically show that uh, so if the first order arithmetic is inconsistent, it makes little sense to try to find foundations which are consistent. Uh, any foundations which are rich enough to uh, to be used to be useful for the formalization of kind of mathematical abstract mathematical thinking, which we are. Uh, so fond of, any such foundations will uh, necessarily be inconsistent if the first order arithmetic is inconsistent. So, uh, so the only uh, possibility here and is, to, is that we uh, mathematicians will, will have to learn how to construct reliable proofs uh, using inconsistent formal systems. And uh, and I think it is possible. It's, it's entirely not, uh, it's not easy. And it's, uh, but uh, I think it is possible. And uh, it is emerging, such a, 
such a possibility is emerging for the um, kind of foundations which are now being developed, which are based on ideas which are coming from theoretical computer science mostly um, in, at this time. So uh, one possible candidate for such, so, so we need new foundations which, uh, which will be formulated in, in a formal system which allows one to, uh, which can be used despite it inconsistency or possible inconsistency, can be used to construct reliable proofs. So the classical first order logic is not good at it because if, if it has an inconsistency then one can prove everything and uh, it's, it, it stops being informative. Uh, however, the, there are other types of uh, formal, uh, formal systems which can be used for uh, formalization of mathematics, which uh, react to inconsistency in a much less drastic way, in a sense. So uh, inconsistency in such systems doesn't mean that the system totally, uh, uh, becomes totally uninformative. And uh, one of the examples of such uh, classes of systems is the class of um, so-called constructive type series. So that is a class of uh, formal systems which have been used extensively for the, in the theory of programming languages. Um, and uh, it's, it's rather standard, uh, it's becoming rather standard uh, thing which theoretical computer scientists may learn about. And uh, what is important for us is that, um, well, they have many nice, many interesting features which um, I don't have time to speak about, but what's important is that a proof in such a system, a proof of a formula in such a system is itself a formula in this system. So a proof is not something external to to the statement, but to the language. It's, like, it's not like there are no deduction rules per se. There are only syntactic rules. And um, proving a statement means uh, constructing a syntactically correct statement of a certain form which includes the original one. It's kind of extending in a certain way. So, uh, so a proof becomes an object which can be studied inside the system itself. And so if one has an inconsistency, for example, so one has a proof of, of A and a proof of non-A, then, um, then one can show in, in many systems, of course not in any, uh, in many systems that any such proof uh, can be, uh, well, it sort of can be detected. I mean, the, 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 the proofs which are, which lead to inconsistencies have, um, have certain negative properties which can be determined by an algorithm. So, um, so what might be possible, and here I'm, that that's becomes a bit of a fantasy because uh, it's, it's very um, much kind of recent activity, so to speak. So um, what might be possible is the following type of workflow. Uh, which in constructive types here in particular is possible. So we take a mathematical problem, we formalize it. We formalize it in a language which allows all kinds of abstractions and which, which is probably even more powerful than uh, that our set theory which we're using today and it allows for more abstract um, steps to be performed and more abstract um, ideas to be used. So using this formal system, we create a solution of the original problem, and that's, that's a creative part which will always remain creative. There is no, uh, no danger about that. Uh, then this proof is submitted to, uh, to a verification algorithm, which, uh, well, we're already assuming that the proof is kind of syntactically correct, so it's logically correct, but then there is a verification that it's reliable in a sense. And this verification will not be, um, as examples show, uh, such a verification algorithm, we will not know whether it terminates or not in general. So uh, if it terminates, then, then the proof is reliable. If it doesn't terminate, then we know nothing. And uh, 
it means that we we'll probably have to look for another proof for which algorithm will terminate for faster. But, but, but also there is the idea that most proofs which one constructs in such a way are reliable. So it, so it doesn't happen often that it, uh, that it doesn't terminate. Um, so that, that's kind of a more technical comment that there, about how to ensure reliability of a given proof term and that there are probably different ways. I mean, I'm sure there are different ways. Like the simplest one which comes to mind is that the solution is reliable, so there is a proof term, apply normalization procedure to it, and if after normalization it uh, lands in the subsystem for which consistency can be proved, so kind of all, the, all our abstract thinking kind of cancels out in the process of, of normalizing the proof, then we can rely on it. And if it doesn't, then, and then uh, it's not so clear. So, um, and, um, so I want to summarize, because the, the schedule for this talk was, uh, I was told to, uh, to have a shorter talk and longer session for questions and answers, because, uh, and uh, the summary uh, here is as follows. So first of all, I uh, suggest that the correct interpretation of second incompleteness theorem is to consider it as a step uh, towards future proof of inconsistency in the mathematical, uh, in the formal systems which, um, which this theorem refers to. And that is, of course, purely a conjecture. Uh, you can say that it's uh, I'm making this as a conjecture. And uh, it would be wonderful if we could find the actual inconsistency. Uh, because then we would kind of know where, uh, th that, that would provide us with, with a huge amount of, of new knowledge and understanding. Uh, but I don't, know, I don't know when that may happen, but uh, even just having in mind that this is a really interesting uh, problem to consider, I think is very important. So such an interpretation uh, definitely cancels out a lot of dubious philosophical um, noise around Gödel's theorem, which I think would be very good. Uh, <laughs> and um, as far as mathematics is concerned, and uh, so if, if there is indeed an inconsistency in, in the first order arithmetic, uh, it would mean inconsistency in basically any uh, sufficiently rich foundational system. So in mathematics, we will, uh, that, now that's, that's my idea, that's the only thing which, which uh, the only kind of solution which comes to my mind is that we may have to learn to, um, to use inconsistent systems to obtain reliable proofs. And ultimately, if we do learn to do such a thing, it will be very uh, liberating because then one can use uh, reasoning systems which are known to be inconsistent but which are closer to our intuitive thinking uh, to construct proofs which can then be verified formally to be reliable. So ultimately, it can lead to, uh, to more freedom in, uh, in the mathematical uh, workflow, so to speak. There are also uh, some important uh, speculations one can do concerning the changes in mathematics which it may lead to and how it relates to the, uh, to the existing troubles between mathematics and physics and stuff like this, but uh, that would be um, more, th 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 that would rather be a subject of a separate talk. So the, for this talk, what my, my main intention was to, uh, to attract everybody's attention kind of seriously to the possibility of such an inconsistency and to, uh, to argue that such an inconsistency would not mean the end of the world, but uh, but rather a liberation of a lot of, um, of our thinking in mathematics, and, and it, it may have a lot of constructive and positive consequences. Um, thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Three 
And that's all right. Um, That's definitely acceptable. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> um, but but uh, when one hopes for something, one also uh, allows for the possibility of, uh, of the opposite. So um, as long as it's not kind of I know is consistent and nothing else is ever possible, uh, any other kind of uh, Intermediate uh, situation is, is uh, I think, a personal choice in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there, there are many such things. I mean, there, there can be many. Uh, we, we know it from uh, Gödel's own work that uh, there is the first incompleteness theory, which which says that, uh, that there are multiple statements. Which, in any formal system, there will be in any consistent formal system, there will be multiple statements which um, cannot be proved uh, from from the axioms. Um, that kind of that doesn't bother me in, in any way at all. Um, after all, the question of proving or unproving Goldbach conjecture is, I mean, okay, I, 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 no, that's all right. That's, that doesn't bother me. So I, I'm sorry, I, I, yeah. So what was your question? Do you anticipate such inconsistencies also in experimental sciences where you can do an experiment and verify what's true independent of what my, our imagination dictates? Well, there can be no inconsistency in experimental science, they're going to be only results of an experiment, uh, by by definition. So, so inconsistency is when when uh, when when one you think is is not what it what actually happens. That's that's inconsistency. And uh, so, no, I, I definitely uh, consider the material reality as the uh, kind of absolute uh, judge of of uh, Truth and so, so there can be no inconsistency in experimental. I don't know what is an inconsistency in physics. I mean, what is inconsistency in, in, in formal arithmetics? I have uh, explained very uh, concretely. I don't know what is an inconsistency in physics. Although you said this would be properly in another lecture, which hopefully we'll get the chance to invite you to give, I would just wonder if you can offer any thoughts about how analysis, our concepts of real numbers and so on, might be different if the usual foundations are inconsistent. So first of all, for that, we don't need them to be inconsistent. We, it, it is entirely possible that our understanding of real numbers is, is, not, adic is not an adequate formalization of the notion of continuity, and that possibility is, is quite, quite real, even without any inconsistency. So this inconsistency here is unnecessary for, for this um, side of the story to develop. And uh, the notion of real numbers, uh, as, as many, um, I think as many different observations kind of show, mind observations, the notion of real number is uh, seem to be over idealized in a sense, so it's, it's an over idealized object which 
and it's clear that this over-idealization uh, was necessary in order to make reasoning about real numbers simple enough for, for, uh, for it to be uh, humanly uh, practical. Uh, and it's quite possible that in, in years to come, because of the development of the computer-assisted um, thinking, let's put it this way, especially about uh, mathematical objects, um, maybe we'll be able to explore other possibilities in which the notion of continuity will be formalized in, in a less idealized way and, and so will allow for, um, and, and which will then avoid some of the uh, physical paradoxes, I mean, some of the physical paradoxes, so to speak, which, which one encounters when one tries to use the usual uh, notion of continuity to, uh, to describe the physical reality and together with the notion of locality, one, one gets into this, a stupid situation where in order for something at all to happen, two real numbers have to, to be uh, precisely equal at some point, and, and we, which of course can never happen. And, um, but but this, is, this line of development is, uh, does not require any, any inconsistency. It, it can be, and it, it will proceed, I'm sure, uh, independently on that. Uh, even if the usual foundations are inconsistent, are, are consistent, there might be a better theory of real numbers. Is that what you're saying? There might be a better way to, uh, uh, even if the usual foundations are consistent, there might be better foundations, first of all. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, second, even in, 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 a, in, a given, in, in given foundations, there might be a better way of uh, formalizing the concept of continuity than the current one. But I, I would rather uh, go for, for new foundations and new formalization of continuity in new foundations as, as a prediction. So, so, so I, I just wanted to make the comment or raise again the issue of whether experiments are, uh, results of experiments are consistent in the sense that it's almost impossible to think about the results of an experiment without putting some kind of interpretation on it. Even if it's even if it's the interpretation is simply that the experiment is generalizable, that's already an interpretation, and we have, you know, um, uh, experimental truths that have in a sense been falsified at the institute, like velocities add and so on. You know, um, like what? That, that velocities add, that you know, turns out not to be true in special relativity, but yet, for centuries, it appeared to be experimentally incontrovertible, you know, that's just the simple, I mean, I could think of other examples, but, um, you know, we make a measurement, there's always some limitations of how we're observing it, and we assume it's generalizable, we don't really know that, we put all kinds of interpretations on it. Um, you, you know, I would almost, I, it, it's hard for me to figure out which is more unprovable, an experiment or, or a mathematical theorem. I mean, I don't know if others want to comment. But which is more? Which is more unprovable? <laughs> well, experiment is, is well, there, is, there isn't really a notion of a proof for an experiment. There is a notion of proof for a mathematical statement if it's formulated in, in a, a particular formal system. Um, there is not a well-defined notion of, uh, it's not clear what it means to prove an experiment. Um, I think, you know, there is this, I mean, it is, one can, one can argue that it is true that, uh, like, because of the quantum mechanics, for example, there, there is a possibility that we all right now just uh, float in the air, because even not quantum mechanics, just, just random movement of our molecules will, will suddenly all coincide in direction and will all move, st start floating in the air. And there is a certain uh, probability for, for that to happen, uh, and uh, and that because of that, the, the the gravitation kind of that would falsify the, the gravitational uh, laws, which uh, which explain why we are actually uh, not floating. So uh, that the uh, the argument against such an argument is that there is a. I I, I like to to use the the expression uh, gap and scale. 
there's like a huge gap in scale between the probabilities involved in our, all of us floating uh, in the air and uh, all the probabilities with which we are dealing in, in any kind of uh, experiment or prediction or anything like that. And so this, this kind of, this gap in scale and probabilities is so huge that it permits us to, to speak of one of those things to, as, as to be simply impossible. So, so that's, that's about proving an experiment. Right? I mean, you're right. I mean, there, there are all kinds of things which may happen with very, very low probability, which you might have made an experiment and like measured something and that something been constant for a year and then, or, or 10 years or 20 years, and then you can say, okay, there is still a little probability that in five seconds after that it will totally change. Yes, there is, but... Um, um, It's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's not practical to, um, to take such a probability into account. Uh, it, it would, uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you're, you should be moderating, so you. you So physics is somewhat temporary knowledge, but would it, could this happen in mathematics? Could you get to a certain state where you sort of believe some things, some mathematical truths, but you entertain the possibility that they will uh, later be disproved and something replace it? Uh, mathematics tends to be absolute, but uh, maybe... Mathematics not. is, yeah, it's, it's um, it has been... Um, Historically, kind of static, uh, I would I would say instead of absolute. So if if, if something has been proved, it's been proved forever. Uh, and one can speculate about a possibility of kind of dynamic mathematics in that sense. But it's it's uh, I think there's again a gap in scale between this and even the inconsistency issue. I mean, well, the more is, the is, more complicated mathematical theories could be that. Have that point. You could have absolute. It's very hard to imagine at this point, and uh, but in it's harder to imagine that inconsistency of arithmetic. Yeah, I should say there are many historical examples of theorems which are accepted and later proven to be false. No, no, but this is simply a for, this is simply a wrong proof, and that's that's what the computers are uh, are here for. So, um, so I, I'm afraid it's time to conclude. So I would like. Thank you.